All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we uh, welcome you back uh, to the uh, very aptly named uh, Steve Malsberg Show. I'm trying to find the soundbite uh, that goes along uh, with this. It's um, it's a soundbite uh, for the uh, for the guests that we are welcoming in right now. Harold Burson, uh, legendary public relations executive and courtroom reporter for the Nuremberg Trials in 1945. Hello, Harold. How are you? Fine, thank you. I, I have to tell you, it is a, an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for, for doing, this, uh, doing this with us today. I'm very happy to do that. All right. I, I, explain um, how you came to be uh, a, a court, uh, courtroom reporter well, back in the Nuremberg Trials. Well, after the war was over... In 1945, May, uh, I had been uh, with a combat engineer unit, and I knew I was going to have to stay in Europe another year before being discharged. And since I had been a reporter for my hometown newspaper in Memphis, Tennessee, the Commercial Appeal, I wanted to get into some other line of activity that would make better use of my talents. And I was able to uh, get a job with the American Forces Network, which was the Army Network in Europe. Uh, And it was a very good operation. We had about 63 stations across Europe. Uh, One of the great benefits uh, for being with AFN uh, in their news department was that you got to stay and live in Paris which I did for five months after the war. And uh, I was writing, uh, we did news uh, 12, 3, 6, 9, and also five minutes on the hour, and I was one of the people who updated the news as it came over the AP and other wires. Right, you were one of, I believe, two soldiers who who basically provided the scripts well, the... I, I, yes, I, I did most of the scripts, uh, and uh, that, that came about when uh, the commanding officer of AFN called me up to his office in early November and said, uh, we're going to uh, really do a lot of coverage on Nuremberg, and we want you to go there and be our reporter. And... Uh, I did the writing, and uh, they also they had supplemented me with uh, four during the course of the trial uh, people who were had been professional and news announcers back in the states before, before they got into the army. And and they've just released uh, the uh, the um, audio book arm of Amazon.com, known as uh, Audible.com has just released uh, the, the aforementioned uh, report from Nuremberg, the International War Crimes Trial. It's uh, basically uh, it, it's an, an, an audio um, uh, documentation of uh, reenactment, if you will, of, of the trial, correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, it's uh, very interesting. It, it was on my shelf. I, 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 I kept my scripts. And... Uh, they were on my shelf at home for 65 years or thereabouts. And uh, Joe Nocera, who was a columnist at New York Times, uh, found out that I had covered Nuremberg, and uh, he did a column on me. And uh, there was a tremendous amount of interest expressed after the, he wrote that column, including some publishers. And the result of it is that uh, Audible has put together this audio package. And, and by the way, you're also donating uh, those uh, tr- original transcripts of yours that you've had on the shelf, as you said. You're donating them to the, uh, to the United States Holocaust Museum in, in D.C., correct? Yes, I did that yesterday. And, and tell me what inspired you to do that. Was that something you had planned to do all along? No, actually, I had planned to leave all of my papers to Boston University. And the reason for Boston University is that it was the first uh, college to offer a degree in public relations, and I have had a close relationship with them for the last 30 or 40 years. And I had 
just in, thought I'd just include my Nuremberg scripts along with <coughs> other uh, papers that I had. And then I started thinking about it, and I felt that there was more relevance to having them uh, at the Holocaust Museum than it was at Boston University. And so I called up the museum and told them what I had, and they welcomed my gift, and uh, I'm glad that it's there. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sh absolutely sure that uh, they're very glad to have it. Uh, we're talking to Harold Burson, uh, uh, PR executive, and uh, he was a courtroom reporter for the Nuremberg uh, uh, trials. I, you know, God, you're, you're, a, you're a, a national treasure. I mean, you're you're one of the few people who are left, and certainly one of the. And there were only a, well, two of you to start with who could claim to have done what you've done. Uh, what was it like when you look back? What what sticks out in your mind the most when you when people ask you to talk about this? As I'm sure they've asked you for your whole lifetime. Well, it was a heady experience for me. I was 24 years old when I was there. Uh, I consider myself a fairly competent reporter and writer, and uh, uh, an event like the Nuremberg Trials uh, attracted the very best correspondents from all over the world, and uh, I was, you know, one of them, and they accepted me. Uh, I was one of the very few correspondents there whose product could be heard live. Uh, BBC, of course, could do the same thing, but uh, uh, I got a lot of compliments from the uh, uh, fellow correspondents uh, that I had breakfast with, lunch and dinner, and associated with for the better part of five months at the trial. Well, I want I want to play for uh, for for the folks uh, a little bit of uh, of the uh, the key moments uh, from your from your. Uh now released report from Nuremberg. Let's uh, let's give a listen. Will, let's give a listen. Among those sentenced was Baldo von Schirra. He will serve 20 years in prison. But the evil he implanted in the young men and women of Germany will take more than 20 years to destroy. Now the defendants know who is to die. But we speak for the millions killed because of them. The burned towns, the widows, the fatherless, and the unspeakable horrors of the murder camps. This was the work of the Fuhrers. Let us now have done with them forever. Ah, I mean, you know, when it, uh, is that actually from your, uh, from your uh, presentation, your report? Yes, that's, yes, yeah. that's. And, it, uh, it's just so hard to look at, you know, and, and, and uh, certainly uh, when you hear it all these years later, when you think back, to the trial, what the trials were about, and what you were sitting and listening to and keeping a record of, and, and, and actually through your pen and your writings, bringing to the outside world. Uh, what do you think now, looking back at, 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 at what man did to man? And, and, and in a relatively short period of time, we're not talking about hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. We're talking about uh, you know several decades ago. Well, I, I have some mixed emotions about it because... Uh, the Nuremberg trial came into being because there was this, what we now would say, a naive dream that if you let the people who ran countries, who governed countries, know that if they uh, stepped over the line on human rights, if they started a war, uh, if uh, they really were pillaging the country, uh, that there was a court that would uh, try them and convict them and that they would have to pay a price for it. Uh, you know, after five or six years of war, uh, as was the case back then, uh, people were yearning for peace. Uh, the president, Franklin Roosevelt, at the time uh, was... Uh, very strongly uh, uh, instrumental in forming the United Nations. And I think the expectation level was much, much higher than what has proved to be the case. So in a way, I think it, the trial uh, d did some 
good because it set a benchmark, and it has had some success in a few countries, particularly the Balkan Wars, when uh, the the, the uh, heads of several countries were convicted after their trial. Uh, but on the other hand, it did not realize the objective that people thought it was going to, and that is that we would have a peace-free world uh, after World War II. Yeah, and when you look, do you? I don't know when are you? Do you follow what's going on now? And you look at uh, at uh, Iran. Do you do you think back to the appeasement uh, of uh, Hitler? And and do you? Uh, oh, very much so. Yeah. You know, I, I, I it's. Yeah, I, I follow the news very closely. Uh, also, what's happening in Syria, uh, what's happening in the middle of Africa. Uh, it uh, people just uh, are, are 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 greedy for more territory, for more power, and uh, unfortunately, once they get in charge of a country and have an army. Uh, they they make use of it. One final question, Harold, and I, I really uh, appreciate talking to you. Um, do you think it's uh, it's impossible that uh, that there'll ever be another Holocaust, or, or do you think that that is a possibility? Uh, you know, if if I hadn't lived ninety two years, I may have had a different answer. But my feeling is that. Uh, Conflict uh, is part of the human existence, and I think uh, people who have not or think they have not are going to try to take what they think is theirs, and I just think that's built into the human character. Listen, Harold, it has been an honor and a pleasure, and I, I really urge everyone, uh, because World War II soldiers or anybody who could speak firsthand, and what Harold has done is preserved all of that uh, by giving uh, his papers to the uh, Holocaust Museum in D.C., but uh, perhaps more importantly, report from Nuremberg, the International War Crimes Trial. It's an audible uh, reenactment of uh, the, uh, the trials, and I think uh, every one of us and our children need to learn uh, what those trials were all about. Uh, Harold, God bless you. Thank you, sir. And thank you. My pleasure. Harold Burst.